So my name is John Baldwin, and one of the things I've been working on for the past year and a half or so is an implementation of NVMe over Fabrics for FreeBSD that was recently merged ahead. And today I'm here to talk about part of that work, in particular with kind of the UserLAM uh, implementation side that I did. So uh, we'll start off with a very brief introduction to a little bit over about what NVMe over Fabrics is. Um, but I want to spend most of my time today talking about code. Um, so we'll start with going over kind of the public API of the library that is, lives in user space that supports uh, NVMe over Fabrics called libNVMF. Then we'll do some code snippets and a little bit of looking at a sample host, uh, a little tool that I wrote called NV NVMFDD. It's kind of like a little wrapper around DD, but does remote access to remote namespace. And then a user space controller, similarly, a couple little code snippets to give you a little bit of a flavor. Uh, and then here's what we'll find out. That, that was where my talk ended yesterday. Um, then we'll find out, based on time, if we get to kind of turning around and looking inside of libNVMF a bit and kind of the internal distractions it uses to support multiple transports. And in particular, we'll try to look a little bit at the TCP transport. So my goal for today is not to do an exhaustive read-through of umpteen thousand lines of code. My, my goal for today is to give you a bit of a flavor of the abstractions that uh, this design uses and kind of a roadmap so that if you go to read some of the code, you have a bit of a starting point. You understand what the concepts are, how I've tried to map the concepts in the protocol into concrete abstractions in the API. So that's, so we'll do like little code snippets, but not, and we'll do some whole functions, but it's try to give you a flavor so that if you want to go read the code, you'll have a starting point and kind of be able to parse it um, and then, then look at some of the other more hairy details I don't cover. So to start with, what is NVMe over Fabrics? Well, first off, NVMe is a storage protocol, kind of like SCSI and ATA, where you can send commands to a storage device to ask it to do something, like read and write. Um, and in NVMe, NVMe over Fabrics, uh, we want the ability to do that, use, reuse that same protocol, but instead of talking over PCI Express, I'm talking over some kind of transport, or transport is a bit of an opaque, fuzzy object, but you can imagine TCP as one, or, or something like uh, RDMA. But some kind of transport, we're going to construct queues on there, and we're going to send NVMe commands that look very much like the same commands you use with PCI Express, um, and wrap them up in what are called capsules. And we have two types of capsules in Fabrics. We have command capsules that are very similar to the uh, submission queue entries you would use with NVMe over PCI Express, and we have response capsules, which are how you get back com NVMe completions. Um, and then we send these capsules over a transport queue pair rather than a memory queue pair that is kind of lists as a descriptor ring that you would use with PCI Express. And commands may have some data associated with them. Just as in NVMe over PCI Express, you have the ability to associate data buffers with commands. Um, using the PRPs or whatever they're called. It works a little differently in, trend, in uh, fabrics, but the same idea is there. Logically, you have a command and you can associate some data with it that either gets sent with a command or a buffer that the, the controller can store data into, for example, when you do a read. Um, but for more details on this, because I'm not going to do any more really about the protocol too much, uh, I gave a talk in October at Euro uh, which you can see there. And that kind of gives more of an overview of the protocol itself. It walks through examples of how the protocol works with TCP. Um, and I'm kind of assuming that you're familiar with most of that for the rest of this talk. So if something doesn't make sense, you can maybe watch that and then come back and watch this one. Um, so one of the things I talked about near the end of that, because I, I spent more time describing the kind of protocol and didn't get as much into the implementation uh, in my previous talk, is that I chose to use kind of three layers of how I would design both the kernel and user space implementations. Um, and they're kind of structured around how the specification itself is, writ is written. So two of those layers in user space end up in this library called libNVMF. Uh, the, the kind of layer in the middle, um, I call a transport abstraction. And the, the job of the transport abstraction is to hide the details of a specific transport, like TCP or RDMA, from the things that consume the library. So if you're, if you're a host, you kind of, you want to think about the fact that I send commands to a remote namespace and it does something and I get responses back, but I don't want to think about like the specific bits of TCP or RDMA that I used to send that. Instead, that gets hidden in the library. So the job of this yellow layer is how do I describe an API that's kind of 
generic to NV over fabrics, but doesn't actually really have very much in the way of transport specific detail in it. And then inside the library, we have an internal abstraction that allows us to have different backends for different transports. Um, so far, it only implements TCP, but the design is such that you should be able to add other transports that are defined into it if, without having to really change very much about the upper layers. Um, and then for the upper layers, we have two things uh, that I've written. I have, as I mentioned, the simple little host, this little tool called MVFDD. It's kind of more of a demonstrator and, a, and good for early testing. Um, and then a controller that lives in user space. It's a little daemon that can export local files or local um, disk devices as namespaces to a remote host. Okay, so the first bit of code we'll start looking at is the library itself called libNVNF. So currently today, this is available in the base system. It has what's called an internal library because um, it's mostly intended to be used by things in the base system. Um, so <coughs> you can use it. It's used by the tools I mentioned. It's also used for the kernel bits by NVMe control. Uh, but it's not intended to be a public interface that we commit to providing things like stability for, for use in ports. Um, maybe if there's a compelling use case in the future, that could change. In addition to the library, there's a couple of headers that are kind of really key for working with NVMe over fabrics. Um, first of all, there's the header from NVMe itself. And this header includes all the base structures and kind of constants you need to work with the normal NVMe protocol, whether it's PCI Express or Fabrics. So things like helper structures to define a command, a submission queue entry or an NVMe completion, the opcodes you would use with commands, um, various fields and commands and kind of how you would extract the different bit fields and flags inside of different things, log pages, the structures you get back from identify, all that type of stuff lives in nvme.h. Um, then there's another header I added. I actually mostly borrowed this or imported this um, from SPDK. And it's a header that defines similar set of structures, sorry, similar set of structures, but for the fabric specific part of the specification. So this was not intended to provide kernel APIs or anything like that. It's just defining structures. Like for example, it has structures for each of the types of PDUs you can use in TCP as well as structures for the types of messages you would send over RDMA, um, constants for different flag bits and things like that. And then lastly, libNVMF has its own header. That is the public header for consumers inside the base system that want to use it that exports the APIs that libNVMF provides. Um, in terms of the library itself, it, it is not a world, it's not aimed to be a world beater in terms of performance. It's not trying to um, be super fancy. Its, its primary job is to give um, a, sim a simple implementation that is hopefully more debuggable. So when I was working, I started off by starting in user land, being able to test, for example, my user space client against a Linux target. And when I had weird problems or when I thought that it did the protocol wrong or where we had disagreements about what the protocol may have said, um, it's a lot easier to debug that in user space than in the kernel. So I was able to start there and then eventually kind of lift some of the implementation into the, as part of the kernel implementation. But because of that, I was aiming for something that was debuggable. I mean, I, wasn't, I was assuming that in the future, if you wanted to do performance, it was going to be in the kernel, not in user space. So it's kind of simple. And it's aiming for correctness. Uh, so for example, it uses blocking I.O. So when you are the host, you send a command, and then you wait synchronously for your reply to come back. Um, and that's kind of the model it assumes. Um, and also, I, I should kind of clarify this point. I claim it's not thread safe. Um, but what I mean by that is that there are no globals, per se. I and mean, in fact, in the controller, I do actually use it with threads. Um, but you, it's your job as a consumer to figure out how to protect objects and not have concurrent access to, say, a queue pair um, that you're working with. But it's not inherent inside the library. But it is actually, if you add your locking in, in a sensible fashion, then actually you can use it in threads just fine. It just doesn't try to do it inside the library for you. All right. So let's talk about the abstractions that I kind of define inside the library for in terms of the public API and what I export to the outside world. And the first one is something called an association, um, which is a word that comes out of the spec from NVMe, NVMe over fabrics. Um, and it's an association is kind of the logical connection between a host and a controller over a transport. Um, and the reason they don't say connection um, is that an association uh, kind of includes the entire set of things that are glued together to make a connection work once you're fully established. So it includes 
um, your, at your admin queue pair as well as however many IO queue pairs you have for sending and receiving IO commands. And depending on how your transport works, this may be one or more connections over your transport. Specifically in the case of TCP, every queue pair is actually a separate TCP connection. So an association can be multiple TCP connections, so that's why it's kind of a different word. Um, so to represent this notion of thing, uh, there's a struct NVMF association and the API, which is opaque to consumers but, inside the, but available inside the library. And then you have a couple of routines. Um, you can allocate an association, um, and you kind of pass some parameters to configure it when you do that. And then when you're, you can free it uh, when you're kind of done using it, which I'll get into in a second. And in particular, uh, well, I think I'll cover it later. But we'll, get, we'll get to more details about associations when we get into host versus controllers. So the next layer down um, that you kind of build, build on associations uh, are queue pairs. So the queue pair is the channel you use to send commands and kind of get responses back or receive commands and send responses down. Um, and, and, and transports are always bound one to one. In PCI Express, you can kind of play fancier games and kind of do some muxing if you wish to, where you can have multiple submission queues, you know, use a single completion queue to send replies, but in transport, uh, for fabrics, they're all defined to be one-to-one. -one. So every, you always have a tight binding and coupling between a single submission queue and completion queue. Um, and there's a routine called NVMF allocate queue pair that takes an association and then allocates a queue pair using parameters kind of saved inside the association and then keeps a reference on the association. Um, in practice, though, as you'll find when I get a little further, while this routine exists in the API, you generally don't use it. I have some wrappers that kind of deal with bundling this together with dealing with the initial command that you send over fabrics to establish a queue pair. Um, and then active queue pairs hold a reference on the association while they're around. And when you're done with the queue pair, you can drop the reference that came from allocating it with, with uh, NVMF free queue pair. So next, we're getting kind of slightly more fine-grained as we travel down. Our next abstraction that we'll kind of talk about are capsules. And so capsules are the thing that allow you to send commands and get back responses. So we have a struct NVMF capsule that represents those. Um, and it kind of <coughs> carries around either a uh, NVMe command or completion inside of it. Um, you allocate those from a, from a queue pair. So given a queue pair, you can allocate either a command or response associated with that, depending on what direction you're working in. And then it's kind of tied to that. So for example, when you allocate a, a, uh, a capsule, that, that tells, it's kind of bound that when you go to transmit the capsule, you need to send it on the, the queue pair that you allocated it from. <clears throat> and then active capsules hold a reference on the queue pair. And when you're done with a capsule, you can free it by calling NVMF free capsule. <coughs> and then one more kind of, this one is not quite down, but more sideways. Um, Capsules, as I mentioned before in the protocol, can have data associated with them. So we need to kind of figure out how we're going to deal with that. Uh, and I do this in two different ways. For a host, what I do is before you send a capsule, a command capsule that you've allocated and kind of configured initially, you can associate it with a data buffer, basically a pointer and a long, or a pointer and a length, uh, by calling this capsule append data function. Uh, and then depending on what you're doing with the, with the type of command that you're using, Either that data gets sent along with the command to the remote side. For example, if you're doing a write, you're logically sending data along with your command to the controller. Or that buffer is around to receive whatever data is sent back from the controller back to you. So when you do a read, you're sending a command to say, I want to read some data. And when the controller handles the read, it's finding the data that's relevant and sending it back. And the, the buffer you attach, that's where the data that, you've, that comes back, that's where it goes. On the controller side, it's a little different. So on the controller side, uh, as we'll get into, you're going to kind of, you get a command, and you've got to figure out how you're going to handle it. And then once you get a command, you as a controller are kind of, the way the, it is defined in the specification, the controller is kind of the driver, the one who initiates I.O. So for the controller, instead of kind of attaching a buffer, you, you just get the command and you don't have the data yet. And so you can either call one function, uh, receive controller data, which is, Okay, I've got a command. Now I want to get some of the data. And so, for example, you can say I want to get, um, you can give the offset and the length kind of in the logical buffer associated with the command of what data I want to receive. And then if you're going to send data, there's kind of a mirroring thing where you can say I want to send data 
to the remote side. All right, so that's kind of the basic uh, abstractions that are shared between the two sides. So now let's kind of specifically talk about one side versus the other. And we're going to start with the host, because that's, that's the simpler one, quite frankly, to work with, or at least what I started with. So on the library side, the, the kind of generally overall workflow that you work with on the host side is that all of the Q pair is associated with a single association in terms of the protocol of the, of the spec need to be associated with a single association object. So you start off by allocating one of these objects. Um, and I, I haven't left, I've kind of left out some details to, not, to make this tractable. Um, uh, the things that you would might configure an association with, there's a parameter structure you pass to this function, uh, or the allocate function, that can configure things like are header digest enabled if you're using TCP. So that then they're in one place and it's a shared property across all the different queues for a given association. So that's why you kind of need to have one to hold these configuration parameters before you start creating queue pairs. So you create your association first. Um, then there's this wrapper function, MVMF connect, that's in the library that you can call. And its job is to both allocate the queue pair, and then once it's allocated the queue pair, it constructs the very first fabrics command you send on a queue pair connect and sends it to the other side and waits for the response to come back from the remote controller, and then it kind of validates the response, checks for errors, that sort of thing, yada, yada. And if everything is fine and dandy, it gives you back your pointer to your queue pair. And if it's not, then you get back null, and there's a way to get an error message back, and so forth. But then once, that's, once that MVMF connect is returned, your queue pair is ready to go. And now you can um, send commands to the other side, you allocate capsules, and once you kind of have them prepped and they're their command queue or their submission queue entry is ready. Um, you call this MVMF host transmit command, and that takes care of actually sending a command across however the protocol wants to do, uh, or the transport wants to do. And then after that, you call uh, wait for response, and you, you tell it which kind of capsule I send as the command so that it knows how to match up the response that comes back. Um, and that's synchronous. That's part of the, how this API is a little simple. Uh, and then the kind of the one slight wrinkle here uh, for the host side, is I need some information that comes from uh, about the controller that I can get from the admin queue pair before I can fully know how to create IOQ pairs. So, uh, I can't remember the exact one. I think it's like the maximum size of uh, how big the IOQ can be or something along those lines. Um, so the way the API works is it, it says that you, as the host, you, you're obligated to use identify to fetch the controller data for the remote controller and you have to call this function update association on your association object so that it can kind of read whatever it wants out of that. And after you do that, then you can create IOQ pairs. And then beyond kind of just sending capsules and back and forth, uh, the library also includes some kind of more abstract things that do some of this for you. So it has helpers to do things like read and write properties. Um, and Fabric's properties are the moral equivalent of the kind of top level command registers like capabilities or the version register or controller status that you have in the PCI Express. And then I, and in some other ones, for example, I have wrappers to actually uh, construct an identify command and send it and wait for the reply to come back so you can get the identified data for a controller or a namespace. So that was the library side. Let's now switch gears a little bit to see how you actually make use of the library in code. So there's this little tool I mentioned earlier, MVMF DD, and it's, it's a very, it's, it's just a toy. Um, but it is checked in. Because it's only a toy, it's buried under tools, tools, and it's not built by default. But I wanted you to be able to go find it and go see it and have some reference code of how to use the library that's around somewhere. Uh, as a tool, it's not very complicated. It's kind of like DD. So it can read from standard in and send one or more blocks to contiguous LBAs of some remote namespace. Or if you do the other direction, you can have it read from a remote namespace one or more contiguous blocks and dump it to standard out. That, that's it. So. Um, but in terms of kind of seeing how the API works and in terms of like testing the initial implementation, for example, it exercises a lot of the APIs inside the library. So it does almost all the things that I've showed you so far. So now we'll start looking at some code. Um, so the first kind of little snippet I wanted to show inside of this utility 
is how we're going to start off. One of the first things we do, assuming we've already created our association, because uh, I want to focus on the NVMF protocol bits, we're going to actually now establish our admin queue pair. So we're going to call the NVMF connect method I mentioned earlier, a function I mentioned earlier, and that takes the job of allocating a queue pair, um, sending it across the connect command and kind of doing that level of negotiation. And you have to tell it some things that go inside of connect. Uh, you have to tell it your host ID, your kind of qualified name, as well as the qualified, NVMe qualified name of the controller you're trying to talk to. These are all things that are in the spec, if you're familiar, the NVMe spec if you're familiar with it. Um, and if that all works well, you get back a queue pair. If not, oh well. Once that's established, then one of the first things we need to do is we need to read the cap or the kind of cap register, which is eight bytes long. So we can call read property, and that will send across the command to fetch it and give you back the result. Ah, so I had notes and I just went right by them. All right. So further down in the function, after we've done that. Then I mentioned that I need to call this update association function. Well, to do that, I need the controller data from identify. So I have a little data, an object here that can hold that, and I'll call this wrapper routine host identify controller that constructs a command again, sends it out, comes back. I've got my controller data. I can update my association, and now I'm ready to create IOQ pairs. Yeah, I said all that. So I don't want to walk again through creating IOQ pairs. It's mostly similar. It's more even of connect stuff. Um, and we've seen kind of how you might use these wrappers that like will do something for you. But the next bit of code I want to show you is actually kind of manually sending the command and waiting for a response. And so further down in this function, or the, in the as you kind of follow the call chain, you 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 end up in a, a <coughs> the caller of this function. It's a while loop that is kind of either reading or writing from standard in accumulating this, a block it wants to send, and then calling this helper function that's going to actually construct a real, fab, a real NVMe command to do a read or a write. Um, so this function takes the Q pair, the, the IO Q pair that we're operating on, the namespace we're talking to, whether we're doing a read or a write, and kind of the LBAs and how many of them we're sending, and then kind of the buffer that's either going to hold the data we're sending or where we're going to read the data into. So the things we need to do, we need to construct a valid NVMe command. And you can see we're reusing the structures directly from kind of the PCI driver, because that's how the protocol works. And we're going to need to look at the results, the completion after we're done. We're going to have two capsule objects, one for the command, one for the response, and then a couple of helper variables. So the first task we, we need to do is we need to actually construct a command. Um, and this is not too dissimilar from what happens, for example, in the PCI driver, if you go look at how it does a read or write. So we need to set our opcode. So depending on which direction we're doing, we need to store the namespace ID, how we store the encode the LBA, the blocks. I have a little comment to myself that do we care about this? I think we probably don't, but I left it as a comment to myself. But this, zero. say what? Set it to zero. Yeah, well, I set the whole thing to zero to start with. <laughs> um, it was more like, should I set this? Um, so now I've got my full command or submission queue entry populated the way I want. Once I have that, now I can actually create my command capsule. And as part of that, I say, here's your populated command. Um, and I haven't fully, if you're familiar a little bit with NVMe, there's some parts that I haven't populated. I haven't told it like how to kind of actually construct um, the SGL for the buffer, because that actually happens inside the transport layer for me. I don't have to do that. Um, but I've, con I've constructed my command capsule. Um, then I say, here's my data buffer. That, that pointer length I got from earlier, that's where I want the data to come. And I do need to tell it kind of which direction. Am I reading the data? Or am I, am I sending the data along? Um, or am the data, is the data going to come to me? And so this is a Boolean, this argument, to kind of tell it that. Uh, because it's, it varies by command, and it's, it's not something that I can infer just purely on the opcode. Or I really didn't want to encode that in the library. I wanted that to kind of be irresponsible as a caller. So now we've got our capsule all ready to go. So here's where we actually kind of send it off and wait. So we just call this little function. Um, you notice it doesn't say which queue to send it on, because it's whatever queue you allocated from. So you, you kind of, you're not allowed to, to mess it up. <laughs> it goes out on the queue you allocated it from. Um, and if that goes fine, then you can wait for the response. And again, you're saying which response you're waiting for a match from. Uh, once that comes back, now you no longer need the command capsule, and you can discard it. Um, and so this is, this is the one kind of thing that's blocking I.O., that 
matters, right? This is going to do whatever it needs to do. In TCP, this may send one or more PDUs and wait for them to come back, whatever it has to do to actually do the data transfer. And once we do actually finally get the uh, capsule back, notice that we don't actually call, in this case, something to allocate a response capsule. The library allocates one internally and hands it back to us. We do have to free it when we're done, but it's kind of a logical thing. You get a response back. So once we've got a response, we need to look at the completion. So we can ask the capsule, hey, give me the pointer to your completion. Um, get the status out of that, see if it's success or not, and if so, print it. Um, but otherwise, if everything went fine, we're done. And then in the calling code, if it needs to loop again, it will. So that's kind of the bit of code for actually sending and receiving a response coming back. All right, any questions so far? Yep. So initially, I did call it append because I thought maybe it would say what? Oh, OK. So you asked a good question. I should have cleaned up the bit of the API. Um, Chuck asked if uh, pin data is meant to be called more than once. So initially, I thought, you know, there may be situations where I want to append data more than once. And I had stored an IOVEC inside the caps and all this stuff, and I never called it more than once. <laughs> um, and I didn't quite bother to rename it when I changed implementation to just store a single thing. OK, so what's the, I want me to read it. So the, the question, so the question is how hard would it be to use AIO for the disk library? I mean, you could write a user space one that was doing that, but that would kind of defeat the point of the optimized one probably wants to do the, all that in the kernel. Um, and I'm not talking about the kernel implementation today, but the kernel implementation is a bit different. It does not use blocking IO, for example. There's lots of async callbacks, and sometimes many async callbacks to deal with different things. All right, so now let's switch gears a little bit. Instead of talking about the host, let's talk about the controller side, or, or in kind of SCSI terms, target mode, which is a little more complex um, than the host side. Um, so one thing that's a little, not quite as clean, but kind of the way it has to work, unfortunately. Um, unlike the host side, where a struct, an association structure really kind of maps well to what's described in the spec, it works a little differently um, on the controller side, in part because when a new Q pair or a new connection shows up, for example, on, on my TCP port for my controller, I don't really know what it is yet till I get the connect command. And I kind of got to do some stuff. Like I have to do transport specific negotiation before I can get the connect command with my QID. So <clears throat> instead, what happens is um, all the associations for a given kind of controller or set of related controllers share a single logical object in the parameters. So this does mean, for example, if you, and, and it, I think you're kind of stuck doing this regardless, um, all the incoming connections on a given TCP port are going to have to share the same parameters of do you use digests or not, right? And, and usually you would probably configure that to be all the connections to your logical I.O. controller anyway to be the same. So what that happens to be in practice in the user space implementation um, is I have one of these objects that defines the properties used by all the I.O. controllers that share a given transport, um, and a separate one that's used for what's called a discovery controller, which I'm not going to get a lot into it today. Um, but discovery is kind of like a name service. It's very similar to what you have in iSCSI for the same thing. <coughs> uh, <coughs> again, there's a wrapper in the library, um, similar to NVMF Connect, but on the other side called NVMF Accept. Uh, the job of that is to allocate a Q pair um, and then wait for the, the connect command to come in over that so that it has the connect command received for you and do some initial validation of that command. And if there's something invalid that it sees in the, in the connect command, it will go ahead and send back a failure and kind of close the queue out and, and fail with null. But otherwise, if it doesn't detect an error, it doesn't do anything. It does not, in particular, send a success reply. Instead, that's left up to you as the caller so that you can do additional validation if you want. Or in the case of kernel handoff, what actually happens is, at this point, the connection's kind of paused and in a good state that I can hand the socket off to the kernel, and the kernel can decide when it wants to send accept, which gives a graceful way to make sure everything gets kind of handed over and there's no kind of data that's been read and a buffer somewhere I've got to copy back into the kernel. It gives a nice breaking point when I want to do kernel handoff. Um, so that does mean, once you've called this and you've gotten back something that's not null, you need to send a reply. Uh, you can either send an error with this kind of wrapper function that sends a specific kind of failure uh, completion back that's fabric specific, uh, 
Um, or you can call a function called mvmf finish accept. And the part of the reason there are kind of two special calls here is uh, the very first reply you send on a controller queue needs to follow some special rules, or, or rather it needs to not follow special rules. Normally in NVMe you have some kind of flow control that can happen, which is optional in fabrics. <clears throat> and so there's some work that happens in the queue pair to kind of keep track of the credits for flow control, but none of that applies to the very first thing you send. And so these special functions know to kind of directly construct a response and send it and bypass some of that logic it tries to do with flow control. <clears throat> but once you've um, validated everything and you've finished accepting, now you kind of have an IQ that's ready, and now your control flow is a little different. You're going to wait for some kind of command capsule to come in, and then once you've got a command capsule, you get to decide how you want to handle it or if, and then send a reply back. Um, and you can call another helper function transmit capsule when you've got a response you want to send back. Although in practice, what happens is the library again provides some wrappers um, where you can say either here's a populated um, completion queue entry, which is what NVMe send response has, says, or even further ones that are more abstract, like just send success, which you just give it the capsule you want to reply to and it constructs and sends the response capsule for you, or send an error that kind of, again, hides most of the stuff un under the covers for you. And in particular, the library does not assume that you're going to one-to-one -one always respond immediately to a command, because sometimes in NVMe, in particular with the synchronous events, you actually need to kind of receive a command and hold on to it and reply to it at some point in the future. So there's no assumption in the library. It just assumes when you get a command at some point, you'll send a reply. So let's look at how that turns into code. So in this one, is actually in the tree. Um, in part because this same library or the same binary gets used for the kind of more production model when you're doing kernel handoff. It just kind of partways through the process, hands the queue to the kernel in that case. Um, but I left it all in the same uh, binary because that was easier to test. So the different source I'm going to go over today, it's all in this subdirectory in the various C and actually in some cases header files. Well, I think all this is in C files. Um, <clears throat> This thing does implement a discovery controller as well as support for I.O. controllers, but I'm not going to dig more into that today. And in particular, discovery controller is always in user space, even when you're using uh, the kernel path for I.O. controllers. So the I.O. controller can be either way. But in particular, um, the design I've chosen is that the connections always start off in user space. Um, and this is looking kind of, I, I, I don't yet handle TLS for a TCP. But by starting the user space, this allows me to do all the TLS negotiation and key exchange in user space first, just like KTLS works now for things like it, for other KTLS use cases. And once that's negotiated, then I can hand the QPair off to the kernel um, and use kernel TLS, and it's mostly transparent, or will be, in terms of actually dealing with, with NVMe over TLS. Um, and then when I'm using the, this, this uh, daemon in user space mode, I can create one or more namespaces, and every namespace I decide to export, I can give it back in store that's either a file on disk or a disk device, like a Zvol if I wanted to, um, or ah, a memory disk. So you can create a synthetic RAM disk that you export, um, which is very similar to what CuddleD does for iSCSI. OK, so now let's look at some code. Um, so this little bit of code uh, is after, again, we're not talking about discovery, and I also, well, not talking about discovery controllers, but for an I.O. controller, when an incoming connection goes in, um, it's using kevent kind of in the main, thread, in the main uh, thread, and it gets a new socket, and it calls a little handler which says, here's a new socket on the, on the TCP port for an I.O. controller, so have fun. Um, and we spin up a thread for every Q pair, and then we call this function for our, our kind of threads main. So it is actually running in a dedicated thread for each Q pair. Um, so we're going to call nvmf accept at the very beginning and kind of let it do its initial validation. And if that all went, fi uh, went fine, we're going to do some of our own validation. In particular, oh, I should back up for a second. When you call nvmf accept, because it doesn't send the reply, it's really helpful if you kind of have the associated data that goes with it. So you get back um, the capsule, so you have a handle, a thing you can use to send the reply, you know what kind of command you're sending the reply to as well as the logical data associated with the connect command that came in. Um, and in this case, I use those things to actually do one more additional validation. I make sure that the, the name of the, the, kind of what NVMe uses for their names, NVMe qualified name, the one that I've decided to say is the name for my controller, make sure that's who they're trying to talk to. 
And if they're not, then I send a specific error saying, hey, you sent the wrong name. That's not who I am. So that's an example of how you might do additional validation outside of kind of protocol defined validation. But otherwise, uh, it all looks good. Oh, did I skip further? Oh, I did. Oh, no, I didn't yet. Um, <clears throat> but otherwise, uh, if, that, if the name matches, then we need to see kind of how we're going to handle accepting this command. So I'll get the actual, or this Q pair. I get the command data from a connect command. And one of the things in the connect command is which Q are you trying to connect on? And just, I believe it's the same in NVMe PCI. Q0 is your admin Q, and everything else is an IOQ. So I look at my QID to figure out which one I am, and then I call one of these kind of helper functions to manage which kind of Q I'm going to do. And for this example, I'm going to focus more on the IOQ pair. Um, so we call inside this IOQ pair function. We do a whole bunch more validation that I'm not going to show you because it would be about three slides worth. I'm checking all sorts of things. Uh, did you not match on the admin queue you actually created on before earlier, like you sent the wrong controller ID, yada, yada, lots of things to check. Assuming all that's hunky-dory, um, then we actually they call this finish accept that finishes establishing and actually sends the reply back uh, to the other side uh, with the kind of completion for, for the connect command. And if that's all fine, uh, <clears throat> if that fails for some reason, the one bit of one of the objects I have to do locking for that I didn't kind of show you too much is I do have a locking around each association object. So I have to make sure I kind of preserve, I, I do prevent concurrent access to the association. So I've been holding it this whole time. So if I get an error here, I need to drop that before I bail. Um, but otherwise, if everything's going fine, I can drop the reference to the command or the connect capsule that I got. And now I can call yet another function, which is going to be our real worker loop for, for how I handle IO commands. So that's where I'll go next. So the body, like what this function is mostly doing, once we kind of have an established Q pair, we want to handle IO commands. Um, so we've basically got a big while loop. And so while we're not been asked to disconnect, we're going to receive cap, receive, wait for a, a command capsule to come in and have it received. Uh, if we get an error, we handle that. Otherwise, get the NVMe uh, submission queue entry out of that, look at the op code, and do a big switch, or not so big switch actually, um, decide how to handle it. And then once we've finished handling or sending a response to the command, um, free the command that we received. So that's kind of the overall structure of what we're doing when we're kind of in our steady state of handling IO commands. So then I tried to make it readable for one slide. So I didn't, I omitted all this. So now let's kind of zoom in on this part that I omitted and kind of look at some of the per command handling. So here's some bits of our switch statement. And it, I just want to show a couple of things. Um, so these are some NVMe opcodes for IO. Um, flush is kind of flushing your, any cache data in your, like, well, that's not committed to store yet. Um, and then read and write are hopefully kind of obvious. Uh, so, but I have one example here of I'm doing some validation. I'm checking a field to say that they send a field that, of something we didn't advertise that we supported. We don't support uh, kind of global flush across all namespaces. Um, and we, we don't say we do in our C data that we advertise. So if they did that, here's an example of how I can send an error back. In this case, a, an error, it's a, in NVMe you have classes of errors and I have a kind of wrappers for some of the common classes so that you could just say I want to send a generic error with this specific value. And I don't actually have to do the logic of allocating a response, filling out a complete completion. And so all that gets buried inside of here and in one line I get to send you an appropriate error back. Um, so that's that, what that does. Um, but I want to keep drawing down a couple more layers. So in this case, I'm going to look at write, because it happens to be a little simpler than read. Um, so let's go inside what actually happens when we've called this handle write function. Uh, so we need to do a couple of things. Um, one is uh, I have some bookkeeping I have to do at the end. So I won't quite get there yet, but there's this function device write I'll get into in a second that kind of does all the work of actually doing the write. Um, and we're going to go there next. But after that returns, then basically the rest of this entire function is just doing a bunch of statistics stuff. Uh, there's a log page in NVMe for which you can kind of get statistics um, or some simple statistics, and all the rest of the logic in this function is just to keep that up to date. <laughs> so it's just, just accounting tracking. Um, so, so far, where I am in the code, if it helps, is I'm in a file called io.c, which is kind of dealing with an IOQ pair. And this device write function that we're going to, 
hops over to another file. It's a different part of the daemon that's dealing with the abstraction of how I manage these devices that I've created to export namespaces. So now we'll jump to there. Um, and inside device right, we've got a couple of things. We've got our namespace ID, um, which we use to look up what device we're talking to, um, and kind of the LBA we're accessing, uh, and a reference to the capsule we're working with. Um, so we do some initial validation that I've kind of omitted for readability. Um, at some point, we get down to decide, OK, now it's time to form the actual write. And we're going to need a place, a, a location, a, a pointer to a buffer that we're going to actually read data out of the command and store it into. In the case of the RAM disk, we can cheat a little bit and kind of do it in place. So I decide to use the kind of malloc memory for the RAM disk and find its backing store. Um, the offset's been computed from the LBA, and so I can directly point straight into my RAM disk. Otherwise, if I'm going to actually do IO to a file or something, I've got a malloc, some little buffer, and that's where I'm going to do my fetch. So we're figuring out where we're going to copy our data. After that, I call this function I mentioned many slides ago, receive controller data. I tell it what capsule, the capsule I'm getting, in this case the offset, because I'm going to just get it all, so I'm starting at offset zero, where it's going and how much to read. And so that's going to read all the, in this case, all the data for the write into one buffer. Um, and if I have a problem with that, I get to send an error. Um, otherwise, uh, so if this succeeds, then now all the data from the write is stored in that buffer that Dest was pointing to. Yes? Uh, or, oh, uh, per, oh, so the question Doug is asking is that um, in this case, I'm sending back a transient transport error if I got an error back from trying to receive controller data and if that should be retried or not. Uh, okay, I'll get to that question later. Um, so in the case that this... The way kind of NVMe defines it, they have different classes of what they call errors. Um, and in particular, they consider that if you get errors during a data transfer, that's kind of inherently um, not a kill the connection type of error, but that probably you should come back and retry later type of error. It is true that there's, there's a bit of this that I'm not doing. There's uh, some status bits you can set in NVMe completions to kind of say do not retry or not that I haven't really fussed with. Um, that at some point I should annotate which ones perhaps should have do not retry or not. Um, um, perhaps, but this does actually seem to be like the most reasonable error for the cases where this would fail. Um, we can maybe talk about that afterwards. But if it all works fine, then we've gotten our data in desk. Um, if we were the RAM disk, we had done it in place. But if we're not the RAM disk, then we actually need to call write on whatever our backend file descriptor is do the right. Um, if that fails, we send a different one, kind of the equivalent of if my drive had died or I got an IO error from my drive back. Um, otherwise, we're all done and we can send success back. Okay, so how am I on time? I probably, all right. Yeah, so I have like, 10, like 15 minutes, right? Okay, so I'm not actually going to get to do the, all the extra slides that I added, but they'll be in the slides you can look at because <laughs> people won't have to have time. Um, so let me skip past these things. I talk about how it, like, what the code looks like inside, in effect. So you can go read the slides later. How we construct a PDU and what that looks like. How we actually send a command and what that looks like inside of TCP. All right. Uh, so, and then I'll, I'll get to questions. Uh, so when I talked in Creamba, I still had a branch out in GitHub that had various bits, and I even didn't have the kernel bits all done yet. Um, but that's changed over the last few months, and I actually merged it to main uh, about a month ago. So it will be in 15.0. It will not be clearly in 14.1 that shipped like yesterday. Um, uh, and a big thanks to Chelsea because they sponsored uh, me doing all this work. All right. I'll take questions. So the question that uh, I saw on uh, IRC asked about, will the kernel data path be integrated with CAM and use CTL? And yes, that's how it works. It is integrated with CAM, it uses CTL. It's not currently integrated with CODLD because that code is very iSCSI specific and needs some refactoring before that can be happy. But you create loons and CAM target layer and they get exported over NVMe the same way they do over iSCSI. So in particular, you could export the same loons over both, which is kind of how it also works in Linux. Warner. Uh, 
Um, yeah, uh, and the kernel, yeah, which I wasn't talking about today. Uh, so the kernel host uses NDA, um, similar to the, the PCI driver um, for disks. It does not support NVD. It only supports NDA. There's one kind of difference between the PCI driver and the fabric says. I will probably MFC at some point. It's going to, um, it might be, I was trying to think. So part of the reason I gave this talk is I probably have, I don't know, somewhere around 50, 60, 70 commits that were cleanups to various things in CTL or little bits in the infamy driver or kind of changing some of the constants and things. Um, and then I have some more fixes to CTL that were kind of making way for NVMe. In particular, with the cam target layer, I could break it up a little bit. But when it came to things like the library, or the host roller, or, or like these tools, they're just kind of one giant commit. There's like no way to commit half of a utility. Like it just, it just got to go. Um, and so I, those were harder to review. Like one or admitted on the review. Ah, your small ones that are little fixes, I understand that. I can't look at this mountain wall of text. And so like the part of my purpose today was to try to give a roadmap to the mountain wall of text. So if you have to go look at it later, you have a better sense of what the things are, where some of the signposts, and if you have to go drill into detail, now you have more context to get, to get there, give you a starting point. So I can't remember if that answered whoever the last question was. Or not. OK. Any other? OK. <laughs> uh, Mike. Um, can you describe a typical use case for, for fabrics? fabrics? Um, can we, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have Alan on repeat. It's great, though. It's very helpful. So Mike Carls asked, uh, can I describe a use case for NVMe over fabrics? Um, so I can describe some use cases. Uh, so I'll start off by saying, why did Chelsea pay me to do a whole bunch of work and implement yet another storage protocol over fabric, um, uh, which is related to the fact that they have a product that can do some of the kind of offload of the PDU handling for TCP inside the NIC. And in order to offload that, you have to have a software version first. <laughs> so you, like, you can't offload something that doesn't exist. Um, so th there's more bits coming might be one way of also thinking about that. Um, in terms of use cases, uh, it's very similar to the use cases you would have for iSCSI. It's just another spelling of iSCSI, but with NVMe commands instead of SCSI commands being the thing you send back and forth across. I do feel like um, the fabric spec seems to me a little cleaner than the iSCSI spec because it's had the advantage of perhaps learning from. Like, there's very many similarities between the TCP transport um, and NVMe and iSCSI. Like, they're very, very similar, the use of R2T and so forth. Um, but the fabric spec seems a little better abstracted to handle things that aren't TCP. <laughs> Um, so that RDMA seems like a first-class citizen and not bolted on the side in quite the same way. Um, but use cases you would have for iSCSI. So if you wanted to have a giant dish shelf that you wanted to have multiple connections to with multipath over a network connection instead of over a PCI connection and kind of deal with your failover that way, that would might be something where you want to send a storage protocol over a network connection instead of over like a PCI extension. Yes. So just to clarify, um, Tom, Tom's figure two sixteen. I should replace all of my iSCSI on SSD with, with fabric. You will have a choice as to which one you want to use. I'm not going to tell you which one you should or should not use. But you I, should but do. I, auto, <laughs> I don't know if you audit or not. Um, you would need to do your own testing and decide what works best in your production environment. I'm not going to tell you which one of this like better. I, I, yeah. Okay. And a question from IRC. Is there a chance we could see uh, fabrics terminated by the host forwarded as hot pluggable disks into guests? Um, I don't know that any of that really has to involve fabrics. If you want to have hot pluggable disks in a beehive guest, that's more about doing some hot plug into beehive, which is certainly doable, but that's a different class of work. Any other questions? Did it make sense at all? You all bored? <laughs> All right, well, I guess I can let you go early to your break. So thank you all.